I want to say a warm welcome to everyone. Thanks so much for being here and welcome back to the Democracy Dialogues. I'm Victoria Kuketz. Uh, I'll be hosting you today. And for those of you have, who have participated in past sessions, welcome back. And for anyone newly joining us, thanks for being here. Uh, the team and I have programmed an important discussion to engage with all of you. And as you know, we try to be timely, responsive, and connect with those who are advancing democracy at all levels across Canada. So I want you all to take an active part in today's dialogue, and there's gonna be plenty of opportunities to do so. And we really encourage your questions and your comments in our chat box. But first, I'd love to have all of you introduce yourselves to me and to one another. So if you can actually use the chat function to share your names, which organizations you're joining from, then you know uh, who your friends in the room are. Um, I think it's safe to say that we're all here today because we care about connection, we care about meaningful engagement, and we care about collective decision making. That is the work of and promise of democracy. So today we'll dig into what that means in practice with leaders who are doing this consciously in community. And we're there, and they're also going to teach us how to facilitate and steward people along the ladder of engagement based on their own experiences. Uh, they're here to teach us about creating pathways to greater unity, to engage in storytelling with all of us, and to challenge all of us to do it in alignment with our values, because the public deserves it. And before we get going, actually, uh, I wanted to throw up a couple poll questions to see what all of you are thinking, and Ashley's going to help me do that. Thanks, Ashley. So the first question is, um, are you guys engaging more in issue-based conversations online as opposed to in person? Okay, so that was a very quick 100% of us are engaging online more in person. Uh, okay, about 8% of us, so there's some outliers, and a few people are, are finding it equal. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, and the next one, Ash, can you put up the second one? Thank you. Do you feel that your voice is heard in traditional town hall convenings or kind of traditional ways of engaging? All right, again, uh, almost everyone saying no with now a small percentage of us saying yes. Okay, so, you know, let's keep th that feedback in our thoughts as we get going today. And uh, we're interested to hear more from all of you. So I'm excited to welcome our guests in a moment, but first I just wanted to offer land acknowledgement. So today we're meeting virtually. You may not be on the same ground as me. I'm currently in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, and Mississaugas of the New Credit Territory. So instead, please join me in acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands we're on today and to reflect on their importance. We must continuously work hard to understand the long history of these lands and recognize what those histories mean for the work of truth and reconciliation ahead of our shared work around democratic engagement in our communities and the ecosystem we operate in. I encourage you to take the time to learn about the lands you call home and think about what you're doing personally to advance reconciliation in Canada. Here at The Exchange, we commit to understanding and taking up our collective role in reducing harm and advancing reconciliation in our work. So thank you for that. Um, and now I'd like to welcome our guests, two people who are doing public engagement meaningfully and with intention. So welcome to Dave McLeod, CEO of Thought Exchange, and to Daniel Fusca, Manager of Public Consultation for Toronto's Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Division. Welcome, Daniel and Dave. How are you doing? Doing pretty well. Doing very well. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, so I think we can dive right into it. So I want to ask you both if we can take a moment to set the scene. You know, a lot's been happening. We're living in fraught times. We're seeing ongoing challenges around public participation. You know, our, our own audience earlier alluded to the fact that, uh, you know, they don't feel engaged in traditional modes and forums of how, you know, public services and others are engaging with the public. We saw just a meager 28% of, you know, of those in the GTA coming out to the polls recently. And yet, while participation in elections is declining, public concern about criti critical issues is rising. So I'm just wondering, how do you make sense of all of this? Dave, did you want to weigh in first? <laughs> let's, just start hard with, there. <laughs> let's just start with a softball. Yeah, make exactly. sense of, uh, of all the issues in the world. Um, so I don't know. I, I kind of want to dig in by by asking people that are uh, in the chat. First of all, I, I also want to say that I, I respect that I live in the unceded territory of the Sinai people here in Rossland, 
now called Ross and British Columbia. Thank you for the territorial land acknowledgement. And as a CEO, by the way, um, we do our best to also start every meeting um, with this internally as well. So I really appreciate that. Um, next, um, yeah, I'd like people to just throw in the chat. When it comes to the thought of attending a town hall meeting or a public hearing, just like put a thought in the chat about like what comes to mind. What's a thought that comes to mind about attending a town hall meeting or attending a public hearing? Anything's anything is acceptable. Just put like what 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 is that? Oh, there we go. Checking boxes. Oh no, I like no. that. Boring. Prescribed. Not represented. Loudest voices. Educational. There's same people. Who has time for that? Language barriers. Thank you. Yeah. So I mean, I, listen, but no discussion. I think we should get into listening today. Um, but I, I think I just want to open this up as as a as a uh, founder of the company Thought Exchange, but sort of an old school facilitator by by trade. Um, I was involved in attempting to put on lots of town hall meetings and public forums. Um, and so, I don't know, I think throughout this conversation that we should get at hopefully some interesting things that are getting in the way and we have some things in the program to hopefully get at those things. But I think one of the issues is like, look what we just said, you know, when it talks about, uh, when we think about public dialogue, when we think about the concept of of uh, how the existing system exists. And I'll tell you for the people, I just read a quote this morning that said, um, when I think of the 15 worst days of my life, hosting public hearings is seven of them. Um, so it's also the people putting on these, not like the people putting them on are like, I love these things, they're wonderful. And I just really feel like it's allowing to further democracy. They kind of hate it. People kind of are skeptical um, and have a hard time attending. So, so, so there's something in there that's kind of kind of broken, I think right now. Um, but yeah, maybe turn that same question over to you, Daniel. I'm curious for... Yeah, Daniel, we'd love to have you weigh in. I mean, I think it's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated issue. And I think, um, you know, we, the responses from, from participants show that there is a, you know, a, a particular way that people tend to feel about the traditional conventional forms of public engagement. But, you know, I have to say, um, in my experience, when we step away from that traditional way of engaging people in that town hall setting and we engage people in more meaningful, deliberative ways, um, I walk away from those kinds of meetings feeling energized, feeling really great about the experience that I just had. Um, and so I think that the problem when it comes to public engagement is really just one of design. You know, we're not designing our public engagement processes if effectively all the time. Um, and I think that, I think that's actually a pretty easy problem to solve in the end. Mm. I think that's a really great comment. You know, things like creativity and conscious design and inclusive design are all things that can be imbued into the process. And yet we're seeing a lot of just kind of turnkey uh, performance-based work, which is unfortunate. But Daniel, I know you're doing things a little bit differently and I'm excited to get into that a little bit more. Um, but Dave, I'm actually going to ask you first if you can tell us a little bit about your work at Thought Exchange and how it's evolved over the years to lead uh, best practices in crowdsourcing, empowerment, and towards some kind of consensus building. Uh, sure. Actually, I'm, I, uh, I wrote a book called Scaling Conversations, so I can't help but I'll keep asking questions. I'm curious to put in the chat, is anyone familiar with Thought Exchange or maybe just throw in yes or no, or maybe or I'm just curious, am I speaking into people that have no idea what we are? Or some people that uh, are have every idea we are. Yes, familiar. Some mostly knows. Tell me more. Tell me more. Yeah. Okay, cool. It's just sort of um, sort of a mix. Yes, familiar. Some knows. Okay, so um, I, what I don't want to do is is uh, a sales pitch for um, Thought Exchange, but what I do want to do is is talk about that. I mean, Thought Exchange is a pretty simple idea. We're a Canadian-based company. Um, we've been around for just about 12 years now, and we're focused on a pretty simple idea, which is you give people the right to share a thought, and that thought gets shared to other people to be considered uh, based on agreement, based on uh, removing bias from that process, so that you can really hear what people think at scale. Um, and I think what's important about that is when I first heard about this concept of uh, uh, 12 years ago, when I first heard about the idea, I was facilitating town hall meetings and I got introduced to someone who was building crowd wisdom technology. And I thought this was kind of a terrible idea. Um, I wasn't very interested as a face-to-face -face facilitator. Um, 
I just was very skeptical. Um, and then kind of got my brain around the idea of um, a town hall meeting with infinite recipe cards in every language where you can remove bias. And I was like, hot oh, damn, that's a pretty big idea. Um, and so I became really interested in the idea of how do you like, how do you get at the thoughts of people that are outside the room, the thoughts of people that are skeptical, the thoughts of the people that maybe feel like they're, they've got an opinion, but they don't feel safe to share it. Cause it turns out, um, that's a whole lot of people. So that's, what's kind of been the last 12 years of, of my life really has been dedicated to try to find a way to get people's voice into solving problems that are affecting them. So millions of people later, and we're now a couple hundred people in a BC growing BC tech company. And we're still trying to solve that problem. Um, across Canada and actually uh, across the globe. That's incredible. Thank you for telling us about it. And um, I actually think, you know, why don't we, why don't we bring our audience along with us for the process and actually do something in thought exchange now? Are you up for that? Yeah. So, okay, awesome. um, so we thought with, with this group, um, wouldn't it be great? Um, anyone have a word to describe the recent turnout at the municipal elections? Um, just throw that in the chat. I'm just, we're going to be using the chat all day long. Dismal, sad, sad, dismal, embarrassing, dismal. Yeah. Um, disappointing. Yeah. And so there was somebody else that put a word above putrid. Yeah. Um, there's a word at the top, which said, um, well-intentioned and, and at the top, you know, you have, um, this mix of terrible turnout, not surprising turnout. And then you have this, this overall notion of well-intentioned people um, that are actually really interested in, in uh, driving democracy. And there's a bit of a disconnect. And so I, I thought um, it's in my nature as a, as a facilitator and uh, is to actually do two things. One, give you an experience and two, approach this from a space of uh, being open to learning. So I'm going to actually run an exchange. We're going to participate in an exchange as a group right now. And then we're going to chat about those answers. So I just put a link in the chat and I'm going to share my screen for a moment. Um, and it's really about asking, what do we believe? Let's actually get to something interesting. See if we can't get to something interesting as a group and have an online discussion, participate in whatever language that your browser is set to. Um, let's actually have a quick conversation as a group of 74 of us um, and share your thinking as to what do you believe to be some of the issues that we're facing. And I'll share my screen. So here is, you can use your QR code. I put the link in the chat. You can use your phone here. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll give about four or five minutes for this. Um, and this, by the way, is one of the ways that you use, typically use thought exchange over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, but it also can be used in a setting like this. So I'll just ask you to go in and, and uh, hit the link in the chat and share some thoughts. And just a quick note that if it's not working for someone or if your phone doesn't have those capabilities or your laptop, feel free to use the chat to weigh in too. Actually, I'm going to, with respect, that's probably not a good idea. It would definitely will oh, you. Okay. And definitely, oh, hold on. Yeah. Sorry, Dave. Yeah, if you can if you can access this, you can definitely access the exchange. So uh, I would say don't put them in the chat because then all of a sudden no one else will see them. So I apologize. I don't mean to incorrect, but definitely. You, if no, you can, I appreciate that. Let's do our, our audience in the best way possible. Yeah, for sure. So 37 people. So notice there's, there's 70 people on the call. Um, 42. That's good. We're getting good. Um, it's, we're going to give four or five minutes to this because that's the other truth about dialogue is it, it takes a minute. And that's another reason why, um, why this art of actually hearing from people is something listening requires patience as well as everything else. So, um, Jackie, thanks for joining just now. Those of you that have just joined, maybe, uh, just go ahead and there's a link in the chat or you can pull out your phone and participate. Um, in this quick conversation, I don't know, press play on the timer. And I'm also going to do something very uncomfortable as a white male, six foot tall CEO named Dave, which is to just shut up for three minutes or so and let people think, um, and exercise my privilege by 
you all think together and let's see what happens. The one thing I'll give you as a bit of instruction is in the interest of time, we have about three minutes. So maybe share one or two thoughts after you shared one or two thoughts, um, head into the rating step and then try to rate as many as you can in uh, the time we have right now. So 57 people, 34 thoughts, try to rate as, uh, as many as you can in three and a half minutes after you share one or two thoughts. Two minutes left. Fantastic thoughts in here. There's 50, 51 of them. Don't worry if you can't get through them all in the next uh, two and a half minutes. Put a pause sharing for a sec. Some great responses. <clears throat> Last minute to play in the third period. Twenty seconds left. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, I want to do two things quickly is, uh, so I'm, we're going to share a screen. I'll get, uh, Daniel and I are going to opine on this a little bit. I'm going to share some results with you, but, um, first of all, I really appreciate, um, the thinking. I want to talk about what just happened is you, you shared some thoughts. Um, you rated some thoughts. You didn't ask for your name. You were rating thoughts, not based on the color of the skin or the perception of authority or the gender of the person that was sharing those. You're rating them based on their merit alone. Um, you saw your own thought. And statistically, you didn't even give it a five-star rating, you gave it a 4.2, meaning people are happy after they've seen three or four other people's thoughts to give their own thought, not a perfect five-star rating. Many of you did give it a perfect five-star rating. I can't see that though, even as a CEO of Thought Exchange. Um, you're able to, we're able to then kind of show you um, what 
what matters to this group uh, in a in a couple ways. So let's just actually talk about first of all um, a couple thoughts that just came up to the top, and then we'll, we'll dive just a little bit deeper. Um, but let's let's start here. Um, those who are already facing inequities and injustices are overburdened and makes it difficult to find time, energy, and resources to participate. Status quo remains unchanged. So actually, Daniel, I'm going to turn that one over to you. There's the top rated thought. That doesn't mean it's the winner. It's just something that a lot of people rated pretty high when they had an opportunity to, but we're going to go in and show a few things there. But maybe just let's take that thought for a second, Daniel. I'm curious for your, your thought on that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that is uh, that is a common reason why people don't participate in in other participatory processes as well, right? And it uh, it speaks to the challenge that we have as engagement practitioners to design processes that are accessible and that can help to reduce or even eliminate these kinds of barriers, you know, that people face in their everyday lives and in, in, in actually participating in in the work of government, and that means going to where people are and making it easier for them to participate through tools like thought exchange and and providing you know multiple different avenues uh avenues for participation and maybe that's a lesson there when it comes to the way that we manage our electoral system as well because you know we give people one opportunity every four years they got to come out and vote on that one day um we don't even give them the day off and uh and then we expect you know we expect everyone to show up it's it's a bit unreasonable maybe mm. can i let's let's dive, i want to dive into something that is sort of related to this just for a second um, i want to show you um that there's sort of a difference in a few people's thinking just just to i wanted to get at a see what a depth of an answer we can get through this so um the Let's just jump over here just for a second. Um, there's two different sort of uh, roughly groups I just wanted to emphasize in here. So when you when we check this out, is that you can see here this is the answer to this. How how long have you how many times have you attended town hall meetings and or public hearings? There's a group that have been very often and somewhat often. Majority um, saying I've been to one or two, with a small group saying I've never actually attended something like that. Um, and so I actually just wanted to actually look at the thoughts and see how they're different as it relates to um, if we look at the people that sort of do not attend face to face um, events and see that what, what are the answers there? Many people, especially youth, don't think voting is a meaningful way to participate. So the same people that are sort of I don't really go to town hall meetings um, uh, that much or maybe there's there's other in here as well, but I'm just um, we don't think this is a meaningful way to participate. So I don't know, do, maybe I'll ask you to comment on that. I'll just keep pin, pinning you, <laughs> Daniel. What, what are your, well, what's your that thought? Is my, that is my thought. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we hear from youth, right? Like, and, and you know, there's so much been written about it too, right? Um, that youth, they don't, they don't see value in voting. They, and there's so many other thoughts that, that are reflective of why that, that, why that is, you know, like priorities, of politicians aren't always their priorities. They don't see themselves represented in in the people who uh, who are who who have put themselves out there to uh, to to be elected. Um, you know, so I I think it's I think it's, and that doesn't mean that they're not interested. Um, they just see their value as being elsewhere. You know, they they're, they'd rather participate in a protest or sign a petition. You know. Um, it's just unfortunate that those aren't always the most effective ways of, of participating or engaging. Mm. That's but great. there were some other ideas that I saw that, that really, um, uh, really spoke to me. There was one around lack of resourcing of, of our democratic like processes. And I think that's a really insightful thought. Um, I think democracy is really expensive public engagement is expensive and we often underestimate how much it will cost to run a really effective uh, participatory process. Um, and I think that that is a major challenge that, you know, but, but when we do uh, put those resources into engagement, and I think that 
Parks, Forestry, and Recreation, if I can give a little plug there, and, and my team are an example of this because uh, the division decided this was be, gonna be a priority and they're putting resources towards it. And we're seeing, you know, real outcomes. Um, and so I think that that's a really important one. And there was another one about, um, it's, it said, I don't know when they're taking place. And when I attend, I feel so out of place. And I think that one also is really indicative of how a lot of people feel. Um, uh, in a previous position when I was working in the chief planner's office in, at, in city planning at City of Toronto, we did a youth engagement strategy and youth told us intimidation at public meetings was a big reason why they don't participate. You know, when you show up at a meeting and you've never been to one before, maybe, or you've only been to one or two, and you're not really that up on the topic, you're not that, you're not that, uh, you know, you're not able to speak to it as maybe some of the other people in the room are. Um, then you're more likely to just keep your mouth shut. Um, and so uh, I think that those are really insightful thoughts. And yeah. to your earlier point, it's so easy to be able to navigate around that level of intimidation if you're the host, right? Like there could very easily be someone greeting people saying, you know, is this your first time here? This is how it works. Like, you know, please move up to the front and just kind of create a space that feels more inclusive and welcoming rather than just like wandering in, you know, hoping you're in the right place and that you'll do the right thing and that you won't embarrass yourself. So I appreciate that comment. Yeah. And I think that also just relates to the invitation aspect as well. So I think one of the reasons why I got into digital is also I resonate highly with the fact that uh, I'm sort of I'm one of those extroverted introverts um, that you put me on a stage in front of 2000 people. No problem whatsoever. You invite me to come to a town hall meeting that 40 people are going to be there. I'll definitely experience anxiety and definitely will be double thinking whether or not I want to attend such a thing and feel when I come in doubting myself whether I should be here. Um, and I consider myself a privileged person that I, I am white, I'm male, I'm a CEO, um, I'm six foot tall, which is the aggregate height of people that are CEOs in the Fortune 500. I have a lot of unearned privilege and I experience anxiety. And then I can only imagine add on all of the systemic reasons why people are actually prejudiced against and trying to imagine that person just showing up at a town hall meeting to be able to share what they think and not imagining that uh, they might be prejudiced against or it might be just like the worst day in their life. So it's just an interesting like aspect of not anonymity, but how and why do we protect people from bias when we ask them to share their voice? I think, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of, of racism and sexism and lots of reasons why people don't just show up feeling like they're free to express themselves you know, even in what we'd call ourselves a democratic country. So there's something really interesting there at work, I think. Thank you for, for being so honest about all of those pieces as to, you know, how we really need to create more inclusive design and really design to dismantle those barriers. There's so many power inequities even, you know, and not having a two-way conversation like we're having today, let alone how people show up in the histories that uh, inform those things. Um, so was there... Are we are we completing the end of our of our demo? Because I um, just wanted to give you a chance to wrap anything up and make any comments. But I'm also excited to turn over to Daniel to talk about how we all do this and practice better. Yeah. So I think the number the only end there is that I'm happy to share. Of course, there's no there's no answer here in what mm -hmm. we um, brought forth. There's some really interesting thoughts, and I want to show that we respect all the thoughts in there, and we can't obviously with time address them all. But um, as long as we have some form of contact info, we can definitely send out a general report so that you can all access everything that was in what we just looked through. We, I know we skipped over it pretty briefly, but there's some really meaningful thoughts in there. I think we can certainly include it in the thank you that we send out today. And I appreciate that level of transparency. Um, just to everyone, I was speaking to Dave prior to our, uh, in our little briefing call prior to this, and I've actually used Thought Exchange many times in practice. And it's amazing how much kind of trust and transparency is built when you're able to go through that, you know, the entire kind of crowdsourcing and consultation in real time. It's, it's so much more unifying than, you know, having to complete a survey afterwards and kind of losing the uh, momentum that you that you grow in a room. So appreciate that, Dave. Um, so yeah, now let's talk about what this might look like in practice to be doing conscious community building consultation um, and all the incredible work that you and your team, Daniel, are doing at the City of Toronto. Um, so yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your work, please? Sure. So um... Thank, thank you. Uh, as you. As you mentioned in my introduction, I'm the manager of public consultation in the Parks, Forestry and Recreation 
division of the city of Toronto and specifically my team works um, in the capital projects branch. Um, many people might not know this, but the, the, the city has a quite a large parks capital budget. It's a $2.7 billion 10 year capital budget and plan which works out to about $244 million in 2022. And so we're assisting um, with uh, the, the design and construction of assets from ranging from a uh, dog off leash areas and new playgrounds all the way to, uh, you know, pretty big uh, community recreation centers um, that are, you know, $60 million community recreation centers that are being built across the city. Um, and so my team, which started with just three of us uh, in 2019 and over the pandemic has grown, we're going to be uh, 12 people uh, by the end of the year. My team um, works with staff on the capital side to design and implement public engagement processes that um, uh, hopefully are leading to the construction of parks and rec assets uh, that uh, really well serve their communities uh, really well. I appreciate that. And, you know, I want to ask you a little bit as um, as well about your engagement team's charter. So like way before meeting you today, I actually had felt have been following you on LinkedIn and saw that posted. And, you know, it really struck me as a value led approach and something that was really co-developed. Um, you know, that's the practice of democracy in real life. Right. So I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, about how about how that came together, about what some of the values are that drive the authentic engagement you're doing and, you know, how that um, translates from what you co-create with your team to how you do it in practice. Yeah, so I really appreciate um, the way you frame that uh, around values-led engagement. It's, 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 it's really how we try to do our work. Um, and the team charter was um, something that I, I did with my team uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, it's something that we we come back to every once in a while um, and we update. Um, but really, it was about uh, defining the direction of the team as a team um, and trying to build sort of a sense of, of co-ownership over the work that we were doing and the ways that we were doing it. And so, you know, we identified a vision for, you know, how we want, uh, what, what we kind of see our work accomplishing. We identified a mission um, and we identified, uh, you know, a, a bunch of team values, which include things like um, uh, anti-racism and, uh, and um, reconciliation, um, localized democracy, uh, collaboration and co-design, iteration and adaptability. And these are all values that we bring to the work that we do, that we aspire to, uh, to embody through the work that we do. We're not always successful, to be perfectly honest. Um, uh, and it's not always possible to achieve all of them in every single process. Um, but we're always striving to achieve them. And I think what's really exciting about, you know, a, a team charter like this one is that um, my team, they're, they're constantly referring back to it, talking about it, thinking about how we can improve it, what should be added to it, what can we take away from it, have we achieved what we wanted to achieve, you know, and I, and I think that that has been a key part of why I think we as a team have been so successful is because of the fact that we did that work to think about what we really care about and what really drives us in the work that we do. This is a really important starting point, I think, for so much work. And to your earlier point, you know, I agree with you, like, the goal is not perfection, but I think the goal can be intentional, conscious, active, and ultimately accountable, right? Because we are going to make mistakes, but ultimately, it's how we face those challenges and how we are accountable for them. Um, so thank you for that. Dave, I want to ask you a little bit about your book, Scaling Conversations, which I have been reading recently, and I really recommend to our audience. Um, one really interesting piece for me was when you talk about how crises, crises like the COVID pandemic can present an opportunity for unprecedented relationship creation, and not just for engagement, but towards actual unity. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, given that many of us are programming or consulting with communities and stakeholders in this very environment? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's um, what I what I wrote about was just this idea that 
if your life kind of goes from, you know, this really great thing that happened to you to this really terrible thing that happens to you to this other really great thing that happens to you, if you sort of look through your life, all its ups and downs, the death of your parents or the uh, first time you had a relationship to um, the first time you had success at a job to the first time you lost a job. Um, if you look through those and then you picture, well, what, who are the people that I am closest to in my life? And then you ask yourself, um, well, are, are you mostly closest to those people when they're only, are they a people there that you're most closest to? Do you picture them on, in each of those happy scenarios only, or do you picture them also in the worst scenarios? And it's kind of a rhetorical question because it's like, actually, yeah, the people I have the deepest relationships have been with me through hard times. And in fact, he can even say, we've, we've been through arguments together. We have had our own challenges together that we've been through. And that's what creates the foundation of strength is, is that actually there was some shared adversity and that shared adversity creates some unity with people that are actually able to go through adversity together. And I think that's an interesting reframe of a, our time right now is that, yeah, we have a lot of things we're coming out of a pandemic, maybe entering back into it and have the war and recession and um, there's a lot of things like it's almost becoming um, dangerous to try to mention all the issues because you feel like you're missing some of the key issues that are top of mind for people. But there's so many of them right now. Um, but I really distinctly remember um, sitting down with an Oma that went through the Great Depression and saying that actually some of the, the Great Depression were, in fact, some of the best days of her life when she looks back and says, we banded together and the people that I was with through those times or actually people that uh, I can remember as some of the fondest memories is when how we had to bond together when we had very little. And so um, there's just something to be said for the amount of um, connection you can create with people if you can find shared values in in challenges. And of course, I think that 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 articulates the challenge that we're up against, because it also can be the most divisive time in history. And I think there's been no no more important moment than to find a shared sense of values because we'll never have a shared sense of ideas. In fact, democracy is founded on the idea that we shouldn't. We should have, everyone should have the right to different ideas. And I think we spend too much time focusing on getting people to agree on ideas um, when actually we need to get people to respect each other's values and to start from that spot of values and say, if we can respect each other's values, then yeah, we're going to come through a really hard time together. And, and actually, maybe as a, as a country, we can emerge from this more united than we've ever been before, because we were able to navigate some of the biggest challenges that many people have ever experienced in their lifetime. You raise a really important point. And Daniel, I'm just wondering, you know, what you would come like what you would say to all of that? How has the pandemic and COVID-19 either, you know, shifted or catalyzed or uh, uh, there's been a lot of challenges as well. So I'm just wondering from your lens of the work that you do in community, uh, what would you say to how you've navigated it all? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it's, I can't say for sure because the work that I've been doing in parks is something I started just before the pandemic. So I don't know, um, you know, I can't compare uh, to what was happening before. Um, but we have seen that people have shown a huge amount of interest in participating in our processes. And maybe it's because the pandemic has demonstrated to people the importance of public space and shared space um, and, and, and the value of being outdoors and being together. Um, uh, or maybe people just have always cared about their parks. I'm not really sure. But we, you know, we have seen um, a tremendous amount of interest in our processes. We engaged, I think something, I think it was uh, 70,000 people in our work last year in 2021 and in almost entirely through virtual means so um you know what we have found is that we have just like so many others across the world have had to shift the way that we that we have done things um traditionally we had very little emphasis on engaging uh online and we had to shift towards doing all of our engagement online and um, you know we're finding that there are significant benefits to that. There are of course also barriers that um, are new to engaging online that weren't that didn't exist when we were engaging in person. Um, but uh, you know uh, a lot of the barriers that exist when you're engaging in person don't exist when you're engaging online. So um, overall, I, I think we've we've noticed. Um, 
people are extremely willing and, uh, and happy to engage and participate. And especially when they see that um, their participation is valued and, and uh, leads to something, you know, um, even if uh, they don't get their way. So, can I can I just double? I want to double tap on something that I think is interesting. That when Daniel first said that seventy thousand number and primarily virtual, um, I, I just I don't know if this is allowed, but I had a question for Daniel that I wanted because I think it's of really it's allowed. <laughs> um, having been in this company for a long time, there's been some skepticism about uh, virtual digital engagement, thought exchange, and otherwise, as far as uh, a, a valid place, but 70,000, I mean, how does that compare, do you think, to the face-to-face -face numbers of, um, of engagement typically in a, in a year? Because I've been, uh, yeah, maybe just comment on that. Well, I can tell you that when I was working in city planning and we, were, we, we kept track of the number of people who participated in our meetings, the number was something like 20,000 a year. Uh, so it's orders of magnitude more. Um, and I think there is a lot of meaning in that, you know, and it's true. There are lots of uh, forms of virtual engagement that are, you know, they're, they're, they're thin. I use the term thin and thick engagement um, uh, when I talk about engagement with, with my class when, when I'm teaching. Um, thin being, you know, engagement that uh, where people are um, activated as individuals and they're not engaging with others necessarily, right? So it's a survey, 55,000 of those 70,000 had responded to a survey. And so it's true that that's not the most engaging way. It's not the most meaningful way of engaging people, but, um, and it is one of the reasons why we've brought on a tool like Thought Exchange um, to, to make that engagement thicker. Um, but at the same time, I, I do feel that if, you know, when a process is designed well and people are asked the right questions at the right time in a, in, in a process and asked for their input at the right moments, um, and that input is valued and used, um, then it is meaningful. And I would say that those people did engage meaningfully, every single one of them, and their, and their input was valued and was used to inform, to inform you know, outcomes. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, I, think, I think it's a good thing. It's how you build trust, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 the reason I wanted because I think we're on this. I've been I've been stared down by many a, a board chair and many a public committee <laughs> to say, well, like, listen, uh, you fancy dancy tech guy, um, you know, public engagement has a respected place and it's a facilitated face to face, deep, thick process, um, and and also it's accessible compared to the digital. What about all the people who don't have access to the internet and don't have access and and with respect, I'd say, I believe I'm going to um, plagiarize Churchill and say, I think virtual engagement is, is the worst form of, of citizen engagement, except for all others that have been created. Because then when I say, how many people are coming to the face-to-face -face meetings that you're talking about? They say, well, you know, dozens. Right. So I, I know that there are barriers that still are there for people to be able to access through the smartphone, to be able to participate meaningfully and to create a more meaningful way. I don't think a quantitative survey goes deep enough to get people to share their thoughts, but more importantly, empathize with other people's thoughts. And, you know, we have an empathy uh, deficit in this world at this moment. So mm -hmm. just curious about that aspect of, um, yeah, virtual, virtual thought exchange, but a virtual every other time I'm really um, a proponent of. It's it's the way where, that I think we became networked during the pandemic. And there's a lot of um, opportunity for us to actually access people's voices. Yeah, and that's something like we have decided, um, you know, in at the city, it seems like we're deciding that um, our engagement going forward will be virtual first, supplemented by in-person engagement where that's needed and necessary. And the reality is that the people who are not, who, who face barriers, many of the people who face barriers, the most significant barriers, people who don't have access to technology, to the internet, um, uh, people who are unhoused, those are not people who are coming to public meetings, as Dave said, anyway. Um, so those engaging um, uh, marginalized folks like that requires very deliberative and uh, intentional effort. Um, and that hasn't, that actually just hasn't changed. You know, that's, that was true before and it's true now. Um, and there's no like, 
magic bullet that is that is going to solve that problem. It takes legwork, it takes resources, it takes effort. Um, and so I think that if we can engage, you know, the, the, the masses in, in a way that is easy, easy for most people to access, can be done, you know, uh, different times when, when people have the opportunity, and then we can focus our resources on reaching those other folks um, who, who, who face barriers to participation. Uh, I think that's a much better use of our time and our resources than setting up a meeting that, as Dave says, uh, 12 people uh, show up to and they end up being, you know, the same 12 people who show up at every meeting. I think that's an important point. And, you know, for many of us who work in public engagement, we know that some of the best practices is actually meeting people where they're at, right? And not expecting them to come to us, whether that's virtual, whether that's in person, um, slotting into pre-existing programming and finding out, you know, what are the centers that, that resonate with people where they're willing to have these kinds of conversations. Um, so I have two questions for you before we go to before we go to audience questions. And I can already see there's some really good ones coming in. Um, you know, I think virtual to in-person is a bit of a continuum or a ladder of engagement. So if we kind of undo the binary of virtual uh, versus public, is there a way to kind of migrate uh, that high level of engagement that we're seeing online and get people back in like physical, um, you know, community squares and centers engaging at similar levels? Um, Dave, what do you think? Um, at risk of being heady, I think it comes down to two words that I'll throw out there, which is uh, representation versus dissemination. And I mm -hmm. think that representation done face to face is a very poor concept, meaning 12 people showed up, they therefore represent the community. Um, right. Though I do think dissemination and sense making and actually getting what we've learned. So I'll give you an example, like we talked to um, a a large school district that reached out and talked to 25,000 parents about um, what to how to deal with masks and things like that during the pandemic. Or another, the current uh, New York State Superintendent of the Year who reached out to talk about policing in schools and and the fact that there had been school shooting and he decided that, that he was gonna put on um, armed guards on site to protect students. Ran an exchange, heard from his African-American population that this was a very terrifying concept in that they have double the chance of their child being shot by a police officer statistically for getting in a fist fight. I therefore now don't want to send my kid to school. I'm very yeah. fearful. There's a group of people that then take that information and get together face to face. And, you know, just like that report where we just had with seven, there's a lot of depth in there. You can't just sort of look at the top three thoughts and be like, ta-da, here's what we've learned. If you go through, and I think there is a room for deep dialogue for people to come together face to face and disseminate. Mm -hmm. still and then say here's what we've learned to our community and get that out to the people that need to know i think that is still needs to be a deep process and in that case in new york state they actually went through and had to involve the mayor and involve the town and actually said we're actually going to change our policy on policing based on us deeply understanding that there's a viewpoint here that we were not appreciating which is a small number of people but it's it's thousands of people that are affected by right. this decision and that they weren't meant to then where there wasn't the two African-American people that were on the the committee of eight to therefore represent the African-American people. It was after hearing from thousands of people, a group of people got together to distill, disseminate that information out to people. And I think there's a huge role for face to face dialogue or Zoom to Zoom in person debate dialogue to understand once you've tapped into thousands of people in the community. Well, what are you going to do about that? That's still mm -hmm. a realm, I believe, of face-to-face -face, or at least Zoom-to-Zoom, -zoom, um, you know, dialogue-based interaction, not not sort of scaled interaction. That's my thinking on it. Right. And so, Daniel, I want to ask you a little bit, a little bit more about public consultation, riff off of what Dave's been saying here. You know, there are a lot of complaints that often consultation goes into a black box that the actual feedback is ignored and that people just do like people who are running town halls or those in positions of power actually don't do much with it. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, your personal philosophy on feedback loops to community and how you actually empower people when they have generously, you know, given their time to the work that you're trying to do? Yeah. So I think it, it starts with being really intentional and being really deliberate about the way that we're engaging, when we're engaging, why we're engaging. 
It's about being honest. It's about not engaging when there really isn't an opportunity for people to impact an outcome. And that's something mm -hmm. that I have this conversation a lot with my colleagues. And I think some of them sometimes are really quite surprised when I say, no, I don't think we need to do engagement on this. Um, uh, you know, because, well, what are people going to tell us? Like, what, what are people going to tell us that's going to change the outcome? Much better uh, just to be honest about the fact that there isn't an opportunity to engage and just inform people about what's going to happen, right? Um, that's authenticity, right? Right. It's just about yeah. being authentic. And then again, it's about focusing your resources in those projects where people actually can make a difference and can impact the outcome. Um, and then again, it's, 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 you know, we have to design processes where feedback is collected, input is collected, collaboration happens at the appropriate times in a process um, so that it's actually useful to, to, to outcomes. Um, and, and I think, you know, and it's part in part, it's what it's, it's the kind of process that Dave, Dave just described, right? It's about, mm -hmm. we try to collect as much feedback from as many people as possible through our virtual, through our virtual means. Uh, and then we convene smaller groups of representative groups of, of folks to look at that at that input at that feedback and to try to make sense of it and to decide where we go from from there. Um, and I think that kind of an approach has been really successful for us. Um, and people are starting to see their feedback reflected in outcomes um, much more regularly. And um, it helps to build trust and it helps to uh, it helps to um, it helps to give people confidence that uh, that is not a useless exercise, that there is meaning in it. And so we're always trying to report back to people, which, Good. you know, we're, 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 we're very, uh, we're very serious about that, um, letting people know what we heard, um, being honest when feedback, we just had this conversation the other day that we're adding a section to our reports, some summary reports, um, response from staff or staff response, uh, where we can be honest. Well, you know what, this is great feedback, but unfortunately, because of this, that, or the other council direction or, or whatever it is, um, it's not feedback we can act on. And so it's about right. being transparent, being honest, and ensuring that you do close that feedback loop so people know um, when they're, what, you know, that their feedback at least has been heard. And one, one other thing that we do is we, we add um, verbatim, uh, summaries of all of the comments that we got from surveys in our summary reports. And that, that is also really helpful for people, especially when they don't agree with the project or with an outcome. Um, and it's happened to me before where I've had a re really angry resident who was unhappy about a, a, some action that we were taking in a park uh, near, their, near their residence. And they said, well, at least I see my comment uh, in the in the summary report, so I know that you aren't trying to bury it or hide it or ignore mm -hmm. it. That's true. Honesty and transparency are two are two of the most pivotal pieces here. Yeah. Um, so we're having some good questions come in from the audience. So I want to make sure we get to those. Um, so this is coming in from Rick. So voter turnout is often frequently cited as a broad measure of civic engagement, but it seems to only scratch the surface what the surface once every few years. Any thoughts on how we should meaningfully measure or evaluate overall public engagement? Uh, Dave, did you want to weigh in on that? Um, I mean, how to evaluate isn't my area of expertise, but I, I will, I think the thing that I would share um, about that is that the, um, I think the level of, of, civic engagement as it relates to voting and or otherwise is directly related to the genuine curiosity of the people in the process that are that are participating so i think that you know if you actually have candidates that are out trying to learn from the public because they don't they actually want to represent they're not running on something that they believe and they've believed since they were 18 years old that they actually want to represent people although then they're curious then they'll actually show that they care about people's thinking and if they do that i think that's the quotient that actually um I, i'll put it i'll put in a, a hypothesis this is not an answer this is absolutely non-scientific here's my my hypothesis is that there's a correlation that could be found if if researched properly between the overall um genuine curiosity of candidates and the electoral turnout because if you feel like people are running from a closed and knowing spot that they are going to do whatever the hell they want, you're just sort of picking one versus the other. It's like, who cares? But if you believe that you're actually, they're meant, they actually have a desire to represent you, I believe that you can actually increase voter turnout 
by this whole idea of people are totally complacent, by the way, is, you know, if you ask the right question to the right people, um, you, people are ready and technology is there. You can get millions of people participating with the right question from the right people. So that is not a, I want to refute the overall statement that I've, you know, complacency isn't a thing. I think the right question from the right people with the right ability to listen is, is the lacking piece. So I'm just curious. I agree not with answer that. your question directly, Rick, but it's, it's, I just really curious how to correlate the, genuineness of a candidate that actually wants to hear from people and then therefore how many people show up to vote um, based on the fact that they feel like they have an, an impact in the first place. And if we broaden that a little bit, Daniel, I'm just wondering, you know, like not just within the confines of voter turnout, but in your opinion, who is creating space to empower citizens in uh, compelling and positive ways? Who do you think is doing it well? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of uh, great work that's happening you know, across the city, across the country, and across the world. I think there are lots of uh, other cities that are doing engagement really well. Cities like Calgary and Edmonton and Vancouver are really serious about doing public engagement really well, and they're doing some really great things. Uh, Australian cities, for some reason, Australia is a really, uh, does really effective public engagement, and they're kind of like a shining light in the field. Um, at the city of Toronto, I think that there's many great examples of good engagement, divisions like SDFA, Social Development Finance Administration, Children's Services, um, the engagement unit that, that uh, serves uh, transportation services and Toronto Water and others, and even Solid Waste and City Planning. They're doing um, really excellent work. And then there are local practitioners, people like Jay Pitter and Zara Ibrahim and Kofi Hope, who are all doing really incredible work for and with communities and in support of local governments that are trying to do uh, better work. So I think that there's a lot to be hopeful for, really. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we have another question that's just come in from Tara. Do you think a proportional represent representation system of governance would make people more engaged with their opinions or the issues they value matter? What is your opinion on governing bodies along with NGOs organizing citizen assemblies? Would like to take that one. I'll take that one. We we okay. I love citizen assemblies. Um, Me too. <laughs> I, I love citizen assemblies. I uh, led the development of uh, sort of a citizen assembly in city planning. It was called the Toronto Planning Review Panel. Um, it was sort of a, a an innovative take on the citizen assembly because it was a panel of uh, 34 people that uh, sat for two years and and provided input on a variety of different projects selected through civic lottery. Um, uh, and it was a, it was an experiment that worked out really well and is actually being replicated in cities across the world. And we, in our work, use civic lotteries <clears throat> all the time to pull together our local, our, our like our, our stakeholder advisory committees. Um, right. I think that it's really important that when we're bringing people together, that they be as representative as possible of uh, the publics that, um, that, 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 you know, are, 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 that they're working for. And, um, and as Dave said, it's not the be all and end all, um, but it is one way of ensuring representation and ensuring a diversity of voices are at the table and not just um, those usual suspects who, who are always showing up. And it, and it helps to build capacity and build people's ability to participate in democrat democratic conversations and exchanges outside of those, of those uh, spaces as well. I think speaking of building on capacity, I can't believe the hour's gone by so quickly. And I see Sarah here actually from Mass LVP. So shout out to Sarah and to the great work they do on citizen assemblies too. But uh, to you, Dave, and to you, Daniel, and to everyone who stayed with us for the hour and so actively engaged, you know, this is what it's all about, uh, making two-way conversations, talking 